This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Paul, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Thank you, Bob. It's really great to be back with you. So the topic for today's discussion is your new booklet, monograph, I'm not sure what we call it, an Austrian business cycle theory that the Mises Institute's putting out. So the first question to ask is, why did you write this? Hmm. That's a, that's a great question. And um, it's, it's um, like many things, it's kind of born out of frustration. Uh, so what uh, I teach is, is principles of economics, and I teach the Austrian style. Um, I like macroeconomics. And so uh, I brought some visual aids uh, for you. So if you okay. go way back in time, back to 1978, uh, Garrison published this guy right here. It's just Austrian macroeconomics. And that was, that was the first thing that we had out there. Uh, it was actually a paper he did in 1976. And it had some graphs comparing the Austrian point of view with the, the Keynesians. And then also that year, uh, Richard Ebling put together this booklet, and it's called The Austrian Theory of the Trade Cycle and Other Essays. And it's just four essays by Mises, Hobbler, Rothbard, and Hayek. And then um, jumping forward in time, uh, in the 80s, the Mises Institute reissued it um, with uh, Ebling's introduction and such. Jumping forward in time, they reissued it uh, under Garrison, uh, he added a, an introduction and a conclusion, but since then, there hasn't been anything else to help principles level students understand uh, macroeconomics from the tools that they were used to. And so if we look at uh, the early 2000s, Roger Garrison came out with his book on time and money, and in it, he had lots of graphs and, and such. But uh, unfortunately, you know, it's kind of an expensive textbook. Uh, it's not even a textbook. It's just a book book. And uh, there wasn't really any anything that I could use in my, my lectures. And so I created some PowerPoints based on um, what Garrison was doing. And Garrison was my dissertation advisor. Uh, and so we, we had a pretty good relationship. And so I was using these things in my classroom, but there wasn't anything that I could point to that said, this is where you go to learn about the structure of production, or this is where it's all kind of put together. And so uh, I was waiting for someone else to do it. And, and finally, uh, no one else was doing it. So I, I had to uh, uh, do it myself. You had to be and, the change you wanted um, to see in the world? So, so I had to, to do it myself. And, and here it is. It's, it's very thin, uh, very tiny, because it's supposed to be that way. It's, it's a supplement for a, an economics professor in their principal's class to uh, add into what they're normally doing. And so some professors are still doing the Keynesian cross. I don't know many who are doing that, but uh, others are doing the aggregate supply, aggregate demand framework, uh, the, the classical synthesis or the neoclassical synthesis. Some are doing uh, a simplified uh, version of the, the solo growth model. And so this will fit in with all of these others because it has that same sort of diagrammatical feel that you have with all of the other things that they see in the principles classes. So basically it came out of frustration and necessity. Mm -hmm. So like other things. Okay, great. So besides just for the general reader who's interested in seeing a, a quick uh, distillation of the Austrian theory of the business cycle, you're primarily intending, or maybe not primarily, but one of the intended uses is for other economics professors to use for an undergrad level? Is that the right calibration? That's, that's absolutely it. And in fact, later this year, um, say I'm teaching principles right now, and I'm going to update those uh, PowerPoints that I was just talking about, and they'll then correspond to the, uh, the graphs and everything in the book, and then that will be uploaded on the Mises Institute uh, website for free um, for anyone else to use it. So, um, I really do want people to be able to use this in the classroom for their principals level students. But um, as I've kind of discovered talking to other people, um, it's an easy read. It makes sense, mm -hmm. mostly because it's already Austrian and Austrian economics just makes a lot of intuitive sense to the common reader. Uh, and so um, you can hand it to a neighbor and say, you know, 
this is this is what uh, the Austrians believe how the mechanics of the business cycle work um, and so forth. So it's it's a pretty good um, avenue for for anyone who's just coming into it or maybe not familiar with uh, with what the Austrians have to say. Okay, great. And the I think the biggest virtue of the Garrisonian framework that you pull through in, in your, your treatment in the middle section of your book is that Garrison gets across, you know, the Mises Hayek business cycle theory with tools and diagrammic, diagrammatic frameworks that a, a mainstream economist could understand. So in particular, using the so-called PPF, the production possibilities frontier and a loanable funds diagram, you know, for, yep. for the capital markets. So that's, you know, two things that you would learn in a regular class. So I think you're right that it, somebody who's even a non-Austrian professor who just wants to give the students the full picture could assign this, you know, in a class and just the kids, once they learn the other tools, would be able to make sense of this stuff. Yeah, he's, he's using two out of the three tools that, or two out of the three tools he's using comes straight from regular principles uh, textbooks. So uh, the production possibility frontier tends to be in, in a very early chapter of any principles book, like a chapter two. Um, and then the loanable funds market is just supply and demand. Uh, so, um, you know, it's just applying it to that sector of the, of the, uh, the economy. Uh, Keynesians, of course, would disagree because they're fundamentally different on their interest rate uh, formation. And so, and, and, but that's traditional Keynesians. And I don't know how many traditional Keynesians are still uh, teaching anymore. No, not too many, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Especially not at the principles level. R right. Um, and so, so it takes these these two things and it combines it with the structure production. And the structure production is unique to the Austrians. It um, is a tool. Well, as Garrison once said, it's just a triangle. Don't go reading too much into it. It, it can't do all the things that you want it to do. It's just a triangle. But but still. Being a triangle, it's it's an amazingly incredible tool, and it's the the thing that kind of identifies the Austrian and separates us uh, from the rest of them, because we say that that not all capital is a homogeneous blob. That the structure, how things are put together, that there's an order there that matters, and because that matters, it leads us to different conclusions and different policy recommendations as well. Yeah, I noticed that, I've told this anecdote before, but repetition never hurts. When I was at, a grad student at NYU and I was going to the weekly Austrian colloquium and so occasionally my peers would say, what, what is that thing you're going to? And so on one of one occasion, the uh, I think it was the other American in, the, in our program, he asked me and, and he said, well, what, what can I read? Like, what's, give me something. And I forget what I gave to him, but it was something on Austrian business cycle theory and he kind of skimmed it and he said, Oh, so it's basically an overinvestment theory. Mm. And I'll let you riff on that. But I, I realized that, that no, with the, with the like solo growth model where capital is just a capital K, the most they can even do is to say, Oh, you might save too much in a given period. And so your present discounted value of future utility is not optimal. But it's not that you could make a male investment like in their framework. That's not even that's literally not even possible. They can't even conceive of that if, if ca all capital is just K, you know, with a subscript right. of the time. So do you want to right. speak to like the difference between a male sure. investment theory versus an overinvestment theory? Sure. So so first of all, when you look at the mainstream, uh, whether it's uh, aggregate supply, aggregate demand, whether it's um, uh, an overinvestment theory from solo or something, um, they don't really have a business cycle. And it's actually something that I talk about right at the very beginning where a Fed economist came to, to my school and he says, you know, we, we had this crash and now we just have to, to get back going, right? Where was this, this cycle, right? And, and they never really have a, a boom that's caused by something and then a crash, but then the crash comes down uh, and then a recovery, right? It's either a, a boom and a return or a crash and return. And those two things don't have to be joined at all. So when we look at their theory, the best or the closest they can come to is an overinvestment theory. So when Austrians look at capital, we don't see a homogeneous blob. You know, I have to cut down the tree 
take it to the sawmill, and then it gets turned into boards, then it becomes a table, then it goes to the wholesaler, then it goes to the retailer. I can't move those those things around. Mm -hmm. And so you could have all of your uh, investment done at the lumberjack, and you could put a whole bunch of investment in the wholesale and the retail. But if you put no investment in the sawmill, there's a bottleneck there. Yep. And, and no matter how much extra you put on either side of that sawmill, it's not going to fix the problem. The sawmill needs to be expanded in order to get the, 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 the wood flowing through that structure production. And so what we're looking at is not that there's an over or an under, because that you have to really use um, a, a general theory of, of capital. What we're looking at is malinvestment where you're putting the capital in the wrong areas of the economy that creates bottlenecks, imbalances, or it's just wasted, completely wasted and, and inefficient. So uh, the Austrian approach where we, we break up that homogeneous K into degrees of substitutability, which is, you know, can I, can I use this truck to deliver uh, one route or maybe I have a second truck, maybe... I can use them together, then that would be complementarity. And so when we look at the structure production, what we're really looking at is degrees of, of how capital fits together or degrees of complementarity amongst different types of capital and that they go together and then they, we, we can actually get synergies from that complementarity. But no other area of economics, no other school actually uses that themselves. Yeah, I like your sawmill example. I used something analogous, again, trying to drive home the the distinction between saying, oh, the economy shifted too much into capital goods construction versus consumption. So the point, folks, is the mainstream models typically do allow for the difference between capital goods and consumption, but usually it's just one thing. Like you either consume or you add to your capital stock. And right. so there to talk about, over investment, like yeah, you might invest too much, but that just means you built it up, and so oh, you you didn't consume enough this period, and so in the long run, it's, it's just not worth it in terms of all the the pain of low consumption today, counterbalanced by more in the future. If you did it the wrong trade off, then that's suboptimal. That's what it would mean. In contrast to a male investment, and I was saying something like to go along with your example. It, it, this is silly, but just to make sure people get the point. If they said, oh, yeah, we're not going to just crank out pizzas, we're going to make capital goods. But if all they did was crank out a bunch of hammers and no new nails, that wouldn't make people more productive next period. If not, all of a sudden, we just all had a bunch of hammers and no nails were made. The fact that, oh, we invested in a bunch of capital, isn't that good? Isn't that farsighted? And won't that boost productivity? Because we deferred consumption. And, well, no, not if you just have a bunch of hammers, right? You obviously have to have the, the right combinations of different things. And that's just a silly example, but just to get the idea across it. So if you're, if in your model, all it is, is either pizzas or capital, you can't even show the possibility of that kind of a mistake. And in the Mises Hayek framework, it's interference with interest rates that screws that intertemporal structure up so that the capital goods don't all mesh together and complement each other the way you need in a orderly structure of production. Yeah, I, I think your, your hammer example nailed it. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yeah. Now, actually, Hayek, when, when we're all familiar that when Hayek went to London School of Economics and he gave those four lectures and it came his um, uh, prices in production book, he actually gave a couple of lectures before that to uh, Keynes and, and his buddies uh, a couple of months before that, or maybe it was a couple of weeks. I don't, I don't remember exactly. Um, and he gave this example about how they were building this, I think it was an aqueduct or something like that. And he said, no matter how much you do capital here or you do capital here, it's not building the, the aqueduct. And, and if you run out of, of savings, no amount of, of consumption is going to help you finish that, that capital project, right? So if you're just, you just consume, 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 you can't even, you can't even invest uh, to finish it. And so the whole thing becomes a malinvestment and then that's what causes the economy to collapse. And, you know, and I thought that was a fantastic example before uh, Keynes and his uh, Cambridge people, and and they they would have none of that. They were just like, no, that's just not how it works. Yeah, it, it, it's it's an amazing little story there. 
If I can circle back, so you alluded to something I was going to ask you about this. I liked your opening uh, example to motivate the the book, where you said, "Yeah, you had this Fed. I think it was from the Charlotte branch. Yeah, the, the Charlotte the Fed. Reserve, yeah, mm-hmm. came to your, I guess your school and gave a talk, and it was something like. And this was what in two thousand nine, I think, is when this occurred. It, it so was it, right after, yeah, right after the the crash. And so you had the two thousand seven, two thousand eight crash, uh, the two thousand nine. Uh, mess that we were in. Mm. And he came to uh, University of Mount Olive, where I'm still at, um, almost there for 20 years by now, my goodness. Um, and he said, um, so so imagine the economy as a guy on a bicycle. Okay. Do, 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 do. And then a car comes by and clips him and he knocks him into the, into the ditch. Okay. Well, now what we need to do is get the guy up out of the ditch and, and pedaling again. Well, that was it. And I'm like, wait, mm-hmm. wait, how is that a cycle theory? How is that a business cycle theory? Well, how a is that a theory? theory? Right? It's not even a theory. It's like, so what's mm-hmm. the car? Well, it's a shock. Well, where did it come from? Well, it's exogenous. What, it, what does that mean? It just means it comes from outside. But what, what caused it? Well, anything could cause it. Is the car coming back? I don't know. Are there other cars? I don't know. How is this a theory? Right. Yeah. There's, there's nothing there to actually just like, well, you know, it happened. And so things happen. And because things happen, just deal with it. That's it, that's not a theory. That's a, it's horrible if you're a social scientist. What's even more perverse, like, so I don't know that particular Fed economist and what his you know, school of thought was or anything. But I don't know if you've seen, Paul, some of the extreme Chicago school efficient markets guys, they will go so far as to say, oh, it's not merely that we don't know what the shock is. But that just shows how, how what good economists we are, because if anyone did know that this shock, what the shock was, then they would have seen it coming, and it, and it wouldn't have been a shock. And right, so, therefore, right. like almost by definition in our system, if the economy goes into recession, no one could have seen that coming because otherwise it would have already happened. You know that kind of a de- of a deal. And so, right. Right, right, right. Um, and I'm not putting right. words so, in their mouth, folks. In case you think I'm exaggerating, I'm absolutely not. Eugene Fama after like in 2010 or something, said there was no such thing as a housing bubble because he said, what does that even mean? If everyone knew housing was overpriced, they would have sold. Like, I'm, right. So I'm not putting words in his mouth. So anyway, uh, Paul, like, it, you it, maybe it, want to react to that like just to show even though the Austrians in Chicago school are anti-Keynesian, that doesn't mean they agree on everything. No, absolutely we don't. Um, and and this this notion of of being able to predict shocks and everything is just an outgrowth of perfectly competitive assumptions, right? Of perfect knowledge. Um, I remember in my class uh, with Richard Ebling, who uh, we both had under on, at Hillsdale, uh, you know, he said, imagine that you're on a, a delivery truck, right? You have a, a, use a delivery truck for your company and it gets a flat tire next Wednesday. Well, you know that because you have perfect knowledge. And so what do you do? You adjust. And so there's no interruption whatsoever. And so if you had perfect knowledge about these, these shocks and everything, they wouldn't be shocks because we would already adjust to all of these new things. So it's not really a theory. It's not a, definitely not a boom-bust cycle theory. It's just, oh, well, this is where we are, so I guess we're going to have to fix it. And so, but, but if you don't know how you got into it and you don't know how it went wrong, how do you think you can fix it, right? Yeah. That's that's just uh, either it's just just your arrogance, or or what? I'm not sure. But on, I don't think yeah. they know. And on that too, again, just to show folks that we're not attacking Strawman, I distinctly remember uh, Paul Krugman in the wake of the financial crisis, and when some people, it wasn't just Austrians, it was also like real business cycle theory. People were trying to argue that you know, oh yeah, there was too much investment that went into housing, and da da da. You know, some of those people. We're saying some pretty sensible things. And um, and Krugman, this isn't an exact quote, but this is definitely the spirit of it, said something like, right now, you know, we, we don't have enough sufficient aggregate demand to provide full employment. Let's not wring our hands over what caused the shock and what got, got us into this mess. The point is housing was in a bubble. It popped. That caused people to clamp up and they, you know, rushed to liquidity and so now aggregate demand is, is too low, and therefore there's a role that the Fed cuts rates. We're in a zero bound trap, and they're a liquidity trap, and therefore there's a role for fiscal stimulus. And let's, he said, after we get out of this and we're back on the road to recovery, then we can circle back and wring our hands and, and stroke our beards and wonder 
what caused this. But for right now, the important thing is to get people back to work. And I just, I thought that was amazing that he was so glibly saying, let's not worry about what caused the recession. Let's just use the same tools to fight it, given that the very disagreement we were having is to say, we think the way you Keynesians or new Keynesians want to solve a recession is what sets us, you know, sows the seeds for the next one. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's how can you cure the patient if you don't know what caused the malady in the first place? You know, if you have a cavity because you're drinking sugary sodas, well, I'm just going to drink more sugary sodas. Well, no, no, stop doing that, right? Yeah, and particularly if you're arguing with other dentists and they're saying, well, yeah, we think drinking the sugary soda has something to do with the cavity. And you're saying, no, 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 let's not worry about what caused it. Let's right now deal. The guy's in pain and he wants to drink some Coke, so let's give it to him, you know, to ease his pain at least because the poor guy's dealing with a toothache, you know? <laughs> yeah. so, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? It is. So. Okay, so it, it'll, soon in, early on in your book, you talk about uh, how the problem that needs to be explained in terms of business cycle theory is this cluster of systemic errors. And so do you want to maybe speak to that? And I noticed that I, for whatever, I, I was doing some work on classical economics and somebody sent me a lecture by Stephen Cates, who has done a lot on Say's Law and whatever. And so I saw a thing where he gave a talk and then Hans Hoppe got up to give a quick rebuttal. And that was one of the issues that Cates was, I think, paraphrasing like what Ricardo and J.B. Say thought about the source of business cycles. And it was more just explaining, yeah, sometimes entrepreneurs make mistakes and that's that's human and Hoppe was saying, yeah, but that would just explain why every year some businesses fail. It doesn't explain why there's a cycle. How come it seems like there's general prosperity and then it flips to above normal rates of business failure? Like, why should there be these pockets of concentration? And that's what we're trying to explain. That's that's absolutely it. Um, and if if people really want to go back to the uh, the early writings, I wouldn't go to uh, Ricardo and say, I would start with Richard Cantillon. Uh, he was writing in the 1720s, and he had a front row seat on the uh, bubbles. There were two bubbles at that time, the Mississippi bubble and the South Sea bubble. One was caused by France, where he and John Law were, and the other was caused by the, the British. But they were both essentially the same, where there was this overexpansion of the money supply, and it created a bubble. And um, you could read Cantillon today. And it, it looks like he's, he's a modern Austrian. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he's really intuitive and insightful. Um, so the question, though, as a social scientist, right, is not why does a particular business fail, right? Not why does a particular entrepreneur just misread the tea leaves, right? Because we need failure, right? It, capitalism is a system of both profit and loss. We need loss, as as a, a really it's a really important function in a capitalistic society but the question is is why is there as rothbard says it a cluster of errors why is it that everyone gets it generally wrong in the same direction at roughly the same time like what could be causing all of that happening all at roughly the same time and uh there's only a couple of things right it can't be oil Right now, oil is important. Oil connects a lot of things. We use it for energy. We use it for plastic. But if the price of oil goes up and I have to get to work, other people have to get to school. Right. Well, I'm going to have to buy oil at a higher price. But what does that mean? Well, does it mean that all prices are going to go up? No, that's a fallacy of composition. Right. I will then have to cut back on other things like maybe I won't go out to eat at, at dinner uh, as much. And if I don't have as many restaurant meals, we'll see a decrease in demand for those sorts of goods and services. So while the price of oil, and oil is important and energy is important, while that goes up, that doesn't cause a systemic change in, say, the price level. So no particular good, you know, good or service that we use can cause a systemic change. And so we need to see What's ubiquitous? What's what's throughout the entire system that connects all of the economy together? And there's really two things. One is time, right? Time is critically important, especially from the Austrian point of view. But time is unidirectional. It only moves right from today into the future. So that we really can't play with time. But as we see when it comes to the Austrian theory, time as expressed through the interest rate does have that sort of connective tissue there. But the other thing that connects all of the economy is money. And so 
if we change money, like how much money there is uh, through, through, say, an expansion of the money supply, whether it's credit or, or something, it's going to have a systemic effect. And so the Austrian business cycle theory shows that there is the systemic effect caused by an increase in the money supply, which then changes the, the feedback system, the feedback loops that entrepreneurs read. We're reading price signals, uh, in particular interest rates and that, that relationship between today and tomorrow. And when that becomes falsified, when that gets distorted, when there's static added to that signal, it throws them off. And it throws them off all in the same direction. Because if we're increasing the money supply, it's devaluing the money. It's impacting it all uniformly. Well, maybe not uniformly, but all in the same direction. And so as a result, it throws all the entrepreneurs in the same direction. And so that puts them on this building process, which we call the artificial boom. Now, eventually, it's got to stop. And so we're going to reach that that upper turning point. And either we run out of of, um, real goods and services, or we're going to run out of the willingness of the Fed to continuously expand the money supply at ever-increasing rates. And so we're either going to have a credit crunch where the Fed just goes... You know, it's too rich for our blood, or we're going to have a real resource crunch. And we can talk about both of those if you want, but I don't, I don't know how, how deep in the woods you want to get just yet. Yeah, let, let's definitely hit that, but let's defer, again, just cognizant of some people that may be listening to this and they've heard people t- refer to the Austrian business like there, but they don't know exactly what it is. So here you're starting to unpack it. So that in terms of the essence of what it is, maybe you want to just recapitulate in your book, I like how you kind of laid it out like a sort of a simple fable and then the garrison treatments, kind of like the intermediate complexity and then you get into more yes. advanced stuff. So the simple yes. one about the, the kid who's got the paper that's due at 8 a.m., maybe just, for, yeah. again, for, for listeners who sure. are brand new to this. Absolutely. And and I was I was hoping we'd come back to this part. So um, this is quite, it's it's not quite an elevator pitch because it's a little bit longer than, than the 30-second elevator ride. Well, if you were but- in like a really high skyscraper, maybe then. Yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> you're right. Uh, so, so the the pitch is the elevator pitch is something like this. Um, imagine you're a student in my class, and for for some horrible reason, um, I have lost all of the grades. Maybe my computer has failed, um, and all of my my digital backups have failed, um, and so I have no record of how you've been doing in the in the course whatsoever. And it's near the end of the semester, and so I tell all my students, okay. Tomorrow, you have to do a paper. You have to hand in a paper, 18 pages long, and it's going to be all of your grade. And so you panic because, you know, it's already late in the day and you haven't had dinner yet. So you have to have dinner and then you have to pick a topic and you you do all of that sort of stuff. And now you start sitting at the the keyboard and you're typing, 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 and you're getting tired because you've been doing everything all day. So what do you do? You grab your caffeine, right? So you grab your coffee or you grab your your tea or your yummy, delicious Mountain Dew, chocolate, full of caffeine, sugar, yellow number five is delicious and great. Well, you're working, you're working, you're working. And now two o'clock in the morning comes along and you're like, what did I just write? Oh, my goodness. Right. Because um, you're nodding off. And so now you need to to have another injection of caffeine. But does the same amount of caffeine give you the same amount of lift? No. So you have to do what? You have to up the dose. So you're taking your yummy, delicious Mountain Dew, and now you're chasing it with some Red Bull. And now you're like, woo, and it's off to the races, right? And so now it's five o'clock in the morning comes around and you're like, oh, no, I forgot to do the bibliography. I got to do all my references. Ah, right. And, and so you have to up the dose again. And so when you up the dose, it's, it's Mountain Dew, it's Red Bull, it's your caffeine pills, right? Woo, grinding them in there. Um, it's fantastic. So eight o'clock in the morning comes around, you come to my office, you take your paper, you slam it on my desk, you say words that I'm really happy I don't understand, and uh, then you go back home and you crash. Well, that's a business cycle. Um, That caffeine that you've been ingesting, it puts you on an artificial high. Now, can you pull an all-nighter? You can pull an all-nighter, but can you pull an all-nighter every night? Not not every single night, not night after night after night. And so 
uh, eventually you're going to crash. And when you crash, that's your body flushing out all that junk out of your body. And so essentially in this, in this uh, story here, we're injecting the economy, not with caffeine, but with a cash infusion. And that amps us up and that gets us on this artificial high. And we can continue this way for a short period of time, but we can't do this forever. Mises was talking about an example where he talks about this bricklayer and he has bricks and he has enough bricks to build four houses. Okay. Well, can he start six foundations? You can start as many foundations as you want, but as he gets going, he starts to notice that he's running out of bricks. He's like, oh, I got to get some more bricks over there. And so what does he do? He needs to borrow money to get more bricks, but other people are also doing the same. And so they're bidding up the price of bricks. And so I can't just borrow a little bit more. I have to borrow a bunch more in order to get those bricks at those higher prices. And so what does that cause interest rates to do? Well, we see the short end of interest rates start to go up. And for those of you who know who, who I am and, and what Bob has done with the yield curve, we see that it starts to invert. And so the Fed has to make a choice. Are they going to add more uh, stimulus to the, to the economy, more cash, more caffeine? Or are they just going to let the interest rates go up? If they let the interest rates go up, well, that's a credit crunch. And then we start to slide into a recession. But eventually, even if they keep infusing us with, with caffeine and more caffeine and more caffeine, eventually someday we run out of bricks. And that's a real resource crunch. And then we go into a, another recession. So either the recession is a credit crunch with a real resource crunch right after that, or it's a real resource crunch with a credit crunch right after it. It's both of them combined. It's just kind of which one is leading the, uh, the other. Uh, so like in 1991, 1990, 91, that was a real resource crunch. But the last couple we've had, the dot-com bubble and the 2007 through 09, those were both uh, credit crunches. Since we teased people, can you just expand that distinction? What, what do you mean when you say the 9091 was more of a real resource versus a cash in the dot com? Well, I, mean, I understand the it, words you're saying, but can you give a little bit more just for people who don't understand the distinction you're making? So, so the the dot com bubble and the uh, 2007 2009, the Fed chose not to continue to, to intervene. And so they just let the, the interest rates go up. They said, oh, inflation is getting too high, right? So, um, and we've just seen this just recently where the, the Fed was increasing the interest rate, increasing the interest rate to slow down inflationary pressures. Um, not so transitory, was it, guys? <laughs> um, and so so by stepping in, they're they're causing a credit crunch, Okay. But suppose they never actually do that. Well, in, in 1990, 1991, they didn't decide, hey, we're going we're gonna to let it go or, hey, we're also going to raise the interest rates. They were still trying to keep interest rates low. The, the economy just ran out of bricks mm -hmm. um, in the analogy, right? right, and so, right. so what we end up seeing is that, that there was the crunch despite what the, the Federal Reserve was trying to do. Yeah, so just to tie all that back to our earlier point saying that whether or not the Austrian story is right, you can't even tell that story in the conventional mainstream framework because they don't have a rich enough capital structure to even accommodate it. Uh, that, that, yeah, in a conventional Keynesian format where, oh, it's just aggregate demand's not sufficient, just pump in more money. And that the only downside in their from their perspective is if you overdo it, or if you do it for too long, then consumer price inflation gets out of hand. But it's not. But it's not that it locks capital, like physical capital goods, that are made in the wrong quantities into a configuration that's just not sustainable in the long run. Like that, you can't even. That's not even a possibility in their framework because again, that's too nuanced for them to even be able to handle. Uh, whereas in, in this approach, and that's why I love Mises' bricklayer example. So just to continue mm -hmm. that, uh, so. There's enough bricks to build four houses, but if instead the guy erroneously has blueprints and starts building six, thinking he has enough bricks, then you can they can also explain the bus period and why unemployment goes up. 
because then if yeah. he re he realizes at some point, oh my gosh, we're going to run out of bricks if we continue. So he gets out the bullhorn and tells everybody, whoa, stop, stop, stop. I got to revise the blueprints and tone down. And maybe those two projects over there, we just have to discontinue and see if we can salvage any of those materials and reallocate them to these other four. So that kind of shows why some factories, you know, shut down when a recession begins. And those carpenters and bricklayers and whatnot who are employed on those two projects, for a period at least, they're not doing anything. They're just sitting around waiting to get reabsorbed into the useful structure of production. And so, so that you can at least tell that story, whereas I've seen, I don't know if you've seen, Paul, but some economic pundit types, when they hear the Austrian business cycle story, they say, that doesn't make any sense. If we, if we realized we were living above our means during the boom, then why wouldn't you work extra in the recession, right? Like, like if you just, if you thought you had 10 grand in the bank and then it turned out bank error against your favor, you've only got two, that wouldn't make you take a long vacation. You'd go work more overtime. And so that they couldn't understand, but yet, you know, in the Austrian framework, it's because they don't have a capital structure element. They just think it's a matter of aggregate amounts of wealth is a number. And oh yeah, if you realized we're poorer than we thought last week, what do we do? You go work more. So shouldn't unemployment drop? Anyway, you can see where they're oh, coming from this, this and it can't make heads or tails of it. Right. This is a really important point that you're bringing up because it's not a question of working harder. It's a question of working smarter. Mm -hmm. So if the problem in like the, the earlier example with the sawmill, right? The problem is that there's not enough sawmills to finish that, that structure production, to get the wood to the tables, right? So that I can buy tables as a consumer. So it's not just that, that, that we're like, oh, well, we just have to work harder. Because we need to know where to work harder. We don't know that the problem is that we have this, this bottleneck at sawmills. The only thing that allows us to allocate resources are the price signals. But the price signals have been distorted and they're leading us down these wrong paths. And because we don't have true prices, we don't know where in the economy to work harder. And for, for Austrians, that's really uh, a key point because capital is not completely substitutable with any other type of capital. It needs to be that type of capital in particular that we need to work harder at. And so if we knew where exactly in the economy we needed to work harder, yeah, I think maybe we could shorten the duration of the business cycle. But that's a knowledge problem that's impossible to overcome uh, because we don't have that information flowing in. That's, that's, a, that's a really important point. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And again, just underscoring folks to make sure you're getting it. That, that's why the Austrians lay so much, or that's one of the reasons that we lay so much importance on the realism of, oh, capital's heterogeneous. It's not just a big blob. And I know some mainstream economists kind of bristle at that and say, hey, no matter what we do, the model's going to be unrealistic. Give me a break. And this is a harmless simplification to get the, and the point is, well, yeah, but if the thing we're trying to explain is the business cycle and your simplification rules out the possibility of it even happening or the thing we're talking about, then that's kind of a problem if what we're talking about is important in the real world. That's, so. <laughs> that's entirely it. And this isn't a new debate, as you well know, right? Bumbaverk and Clark, so John Bates Clark, uh, who's an American economist in 1880s uh, and 1890s, had this uh, had a couple of rounds with uh, of a debate with uh, Eugen Bumbaverk, who is uh, Mises' teacher, and they went back and forth for, oh, I don't know, maybe five or six different articles. And then there was a pause between them. And then there was another debate between them. And then that debate was picked up in the 30s between uh, F.A. Hayek and Frank Knight. Each one taking, you know, Hayek was taking Bombavik on the Austrian side. Uh, Knight was taking the uh, Clarkian view. And then Milton Friedman picks up on Knight uh, after him. And so, so this debate between the Austrians and the mainstream has gone on for about 130 some years now. Mm -hmm. And what we, what we see is that even in these earliest articles by, by John Clark, he's saying, well, I can take a whaling ship and transform it into a shoe company because capital is just this ubiquitous fund. And so as I take my profits out of the whaling ship, I can now can just in, in, invest it in this other thing over here. And so it just seamlessly flows. And there's no problem because they're just looking at it in terms of dollar signs as that aggregate fund. And the Austrians said, you know, 
time out. There's real differences when we're looking at, at substitution and complementarity uh, differences between different pieces of capital, right? It's not 100% substitutable. There's these complementarities that become necessary in, in what we're overall doing. Yep, and a different example I remember. So I'm remembering when Israel Kersner taught the history of thought. I took his course uh, when I was at NYU, and he was talking about the capital debates between Frank Knight and Hayek. And he, so this was the example Kersner's. I don't know if Frank Knight himself used this or if Kersner was just trying to come up with a way to present it to us, you know, to, just to get okay. the point across. But he was saying, like, Knight, Knight was arguing with Hayek and saying, um, look, as long as stuff is synchronized, we can abstract away from the time element. So if it's like a dry cleaner and you, you know, you get into a rhythm where at the end of the work week, you go and you take your five dress shirts and you hand them over your dirty ones. And then the dry cleaner hands you the five that you dropped off last time. And from your point of view, it's like you hand over five dirty shirts and then right in the same five minutes, you get five clean shirts. And so you don't need to worry about the, like, the physical fact that it takes time. And Kersner's point was, Sure, if you're in an equilibrium and just doing the same thing week in and week out, then maybe yeah. the fact that it takes actually a while for them to dry clean your shirts doesn't matter. But certainly if there is a something unexpected or you, your plans change, then it really does matter. Yeah. You know, that, like oh, geez, I, yeah, like I, yeah, right. If I want that particular shirt to wear to a wedding on Saturday. The fact that I can show up and hand that shirt in, it matters that they can't just, you know, five minutes later, hand me back the clean shirt. And so that's kind of the, the point that, yes, in certain applications to keep the math tractable is the word they use. These mainstream mathematical-based economists can make simplifying assumptions and get nice results. But <laughs> if that abstracts away from the thing in the real world that's actually one of the drivers of the thing we're studying, that's not a harmless simplification. That's just sweeping away the very thing under discussion. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, yeah, Clark, uh, I think that was in his Genesis of Capital article Back in the 1890s, he called it synchronization. Mm -hmm. And he has this, this whole little A goes to A prime to A double prime and, and so on. So, so yeah, I don't know if, I don't think he used dry cleaning, but he absolutely uses that, that sort of idea in his, uh, in his article. Absolutely. So it's an old, it's a long debate. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, not enough people have, have bought into the, to the Austrian side. It seems just those that are successful entrepreneurs and uh, and some really good economists are are the um, uh, are the ones that have adopted Austrian capital theory. Well, it's funny you say it that way because that leads into what I what I was truly going to ask you. The very next question is: I know some people, perhaps understandably, say, "Wait a minute, aren't you Austrians big on the market's great and entrepreneurs rah rah rah? Your theory's been around for a hundred years, and so if it's right." You're telling me all the entrepreneurs are just systematically fooled all the time by the Fed rate cuts, and they think, oh, there's more capital available because interest rates went down. That w why don't the entrepreneurs see what's going on if if it all it takes is to read Paul Swick's book? Give me a break. So what do you say to well, that? Yeah, that would that would be great because um, <laughs> well, so I'm not actually making any money off of this book. It's uh, just for the Mises Institute, and I really believe um, for the the educational quality of it. So, so I, I would say, oh, I'd be making tons of money if people were buying my book, but that's not true. Uh, I would be just as poor as I am now, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, what they're doing is they're taking their own idea of rational expectations and perfect knowledge and applying it to our model, right? We don't actually do that. We, we Austrians look at the future through a lens of uncertainty, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We we can try to use the past and past prices to give us some some idea of where we have been and maybe a little bit of where we're going. And then we look at the different conditions that are taking place in the market. And as entrepreneurs, we're trying to forecast um, and 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 adjust to these different conditions. But to to simply say that when the Fed increases the money supply, okay, let's suppose I'm fully fully aware of, of everything in the book. I mean, literally, I've written the book. So, okay, uh, I think that interest rates are going to be artificially low. Okay, but how much? I don't know. When will we hit that upper turning point? I, I don't know. 
right? What's the timing of all of this? Which areas of the economy this time are, are we going to see the bubble in? Or is it going to be a generalized bubble? I don't know, right? So there's the particular instances of time and place, the particular circumstances that are occurring as the money is expanding, right? We don't, money is fungible. I can't distinguish new dollars from old dollars and say, I'd like to borrow money for my project. And they say, sure, here's some money. And I go, oh, no, 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 not those new dollars, sir. Mm -hmm. I, I just need the old dollars, right? It's fungible. So there's no way that we can, we can make that sort of distinction. And so um, we can broaden broadly. We can, we can make broad points, but we can't really simply say, this is the date that it's going to occur. And that, as an entrepreneur, is what I need. Mm -hmm. and, and just, yeah, great stuff. Just to elaborate on some of those points, even if one could, uh, you could imagine, for example, someone's like, oh, no, I'm only going to go to whatever, private funding. I'm not going to borrow from a commercial bank because they do fractional reserve lending and I don't trust that or whatever. Still, in order to for the for the unsustainable boom to not occur, it would mean every single potential entrepreneur would would exercise such restraint. And clearly that's not so even if yeah, so even if you know that, oh yeah, like like for example, just to make to not make it abstract to make it real, I lived in Nashville uh in the mid two thousands going into the housing boom and bust. And I talked to the the guy who actually built my house. He was an older guy and he was had seen a lot of these cycles. And so he knew, oh yeah, this housing is way overpriced. And he stopped starting new, you know, he refrained from starting new projects like in 2000, late 2005, something like that. I don't remember the exact t timing, but he knew to get out was my point. And then, but he was pointing to me, like he was referring to in our own neighborhood, uh, several homes that were under construction and then just stopped. And they were just sitting there, you know, unfinished for a long time before somebody finally, you know, there was foreclosure or whatever happened. And he was saying, yeah, I, he said, I would drive by and see, and they were all, there were kids in their 20s that were doing that. Like they just, they had never lived through a, a cycle like this. They had no idea about, they just thought they were making money hand over fist. And I knew to stay out of that. So the point is, even though that guy didn't get sucked in by the mania, he couldn't stop other people from getting sucked in. And so the economy still went into a crash, even though there were old timers like him who knew, yeah, this is, this is dangerous. Yeah. One of, one of my favorite articles on this point is uh, written by my by my office mate Greg Dempster, and he co-wrote it with Tony Carilli over at uh, Hamp Hampton Sydney. Um, and um, he asked, you know, hey, you do you want in on this this article? And I was busy doing something else, and I missed out. But it's it's a fantastic article where he looks at Austrian business cycle theory through the lens of the entrepreneur in a prisoner's dilemma, right? Do I decide to borrow and invest in the short run, knowing that there's a bubble, knowing that that this this is an artificial interest rate, or do I not? Right, and and by using that sort of prisoner's dilemma, even you know I have to, otherwise I'm going to lose. Right, I'm going to lose my business because if I don't go down this path, if I don't get in on the bubble, I won't make enough rate of return. Right. So if everyone else is on this artificial bubble and they're all making eight percent and I'm not in that and I'm just making four percent, I'm left behind. That's an economic loss. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And we'll, by the way, folks, we'll link to all this stuff that Paul's referred to a lot of things and I'll, I'll link to them on the show notes page. And then even to take that one step further, you could say in a mature profit and loss system, if there are a bunch of people out there making very short-sighted moves and they're earning a high rate of return for their clients, like say if it's a hedge fund manager or something and they're getting on the mortgage-backed securities and doing all this and Moody's is getting them AAA ratings, but some other firms know, yeah, that stuff, that's that's toxic. I don't want to touch that. And what would happen if it were true laissez-faire is, yep, during the boom, the conservative hedge funds would post lower rates of return and maybe they'd lose some clients but they would say, trust us, this is this is dangerous. And then once everything blew up and melted down, the people that were very leveraged would all go bust. And then their assets would get reallocated to the more prudent ones. But not if everybody gets bailed out or if a bunch of them get bailed out. That's So that's one of the reasons, again, that Austrian types were so against the bank bailouts and everything besides just the, the abstract ethical principles. But just to say, no, a profit and loss system, if you make a bunch of bad mistakes, you need to 
suffer the losses. Otherwise, that doesn't reward the people who were farsighted and prudent when everybody else was making money hand over fist. Yeah, one one of the, the things that we see, uh, and I alluded to this earlier, is that capitalism is about profit and loss. Loss and bankruptcy is a necessary component of, of a business cycle. You don't want to have to go to the dentist because you've been drinking so many sugary sodas, but if you don't get that cavity fixed, it's just going to get worse and worse. And so you have to go through that sort of bankruptcy process. And so imagine uh, if back in 2008, General Motors was allowed to actually, for real, go out of business. Well, what would happen? Well, is there value in Corvette? Sure. Is there value in Cadillac? Absolutely. What would they do? Well, they would have to sell off Cadillac maybe all together as a unit, maybe in bits and pieces. To who would they sell it? It could be anyone. It could be um, BMW. It could be uh, Lexus. It could be Elon Musk, right? Who knows? Now, here's the difference. When that new owner goes to buy it, because this is a going out of business sale, do they have to buy it at full price? Do they have to pay top dollar to get Cadillac? And the answer is no, right? It's pennies on the dollar because this is a going out of business sale. And so that means the new owner could go to those same machines and turn them on and then build exactly the very same car and then sell that very same car the next day at the very same price. But because the new owner has a lower cost structure because it was paid for pennies on the dollar, they can now make a profit. And so what we see is that we convert the recession into a recovery through that bankruptcy process by letting these different businesses fail. Now, unfortunately, not all of the capital can be, re be recovered. Some of it's going to get thrown away. Some of it, unfortunately, is wasted um, because we should never have gone down that path in the first place. But the, the majority of that capital that has substitutable components and, and complementary components to other areas of the economy get replugged in into the economy, and then we start that, that solid foundation and recover back to a, a growth of the economy. So we yep. need to have that sort of loss. We need to have these, these failures, uh, as painful as they are, right? Now, here's the difference. If we look at the 2021, 1920, 1921 recession, so over 100 years ago, that recession was sharper than the crash in the beginning of the Great Depression in 1939. But in 18 months, we were out. In 18 months, we were out. Now, could you, if you lost your job, survive for 18 months without a job? Well, I'm going to have to dig into my savings. I'm going to have to raid my 401k. I'm going to have to maybe get help from neighbors and parents or you know family or someone, right? But for 18 months, man... We can do it, right? You and me. But what we see today is that we are so afraid of the depth of the recession that we trade it off for duration. And we see this under Obama when he, he instituted all of these, these policies to, to cut the bottom of the recession off, not let it go through that full bankruptcy. And so it prolonged it and it went on and on and on. So yeah, it's true. Not as many people lost their jobs, but the people who lost their jobs lost it for much longer durations, for years, and your skills atrophy for years, right? You become unhirable because you're no longer doing what you used to do. It's like, well, what have you been doing? I've been out of job, out of work for the last three years, right? Well, who's going who's gonna to hire you now, right? And so now you're stuck in that welfare uh, treadmill, just, just spinning around. So I, 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 I'm really disturbed by these policies that, that make that trade-off of depth and they cut the depth and the result is the duration, just making it longer and worse. Yeah, I mean, if you look, folks, at a chart of the uh, percent of the workforce that's employed, it's, it, it fell off a cliff in the 08 recession and then it came back somewhat and then it fell off another cliff going into the lockdowns. And then it, it, it did bounce back somewhat, but it didn't even attain its pre-lockdown level. So again, even though 
the unemployment rate officially is pretty low by historical standards, the percentage of the civilian non-institutional, you know, civilian population that's actually working is a lot lower. And it's not just aging, because again, it you can see it fell off a cliff going into into the 2020 lockdowns. Yeah, we look at the growth rates in the Obama years and we're averaging at like 1.8%. I mean, it's under two. I mean, that's anemic. You know, mm-hmm. we used to, you know, from World War II through through Obama, we were growing at a clip of of 3.6% average per year. And then after Obama, the average from World War II until the end of Obama, it was 3.4. In other words, his growth rates were so bad that it shifted the the 70-year cycle down. I mean, it moved the entire averages down. I mean, that's that's pretty significant. That's terrible growth. And yet Ben Bernanke, who was the Fed chair during that transition, gets the Nobel Prize. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, well, we should stop it there. Uh, The book is Austrian Business Cycle Theory by Paul Swick. And there you can, if you're watching the video, you can see him holding it up there. It's available at Mises.org for free. Paul gets 100% of all those profits, which is zero. zero. Uh, So, Paul, thanks so much for writing the book and for taking time to talk about it with us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.